And we can even wire these energies together in a funky way where it becomes stateful. So this here is a flip-flop where basically the, the D input is stored and the Q output whenever the clock uh, goes from low to high. So, so yeah, you can, you can raise the clock and then after that you can do whatever you want with D, the Q output will remain what it was when you have raised the clock. Yeah, we can go. Uh, okay, next one. Yeah, so then an FPGA is basically something where you have these blocks and inside these blocks you can put your own uh, Boolean functions that are internally will be built up from lookup tables that are internally built from these navigates. And then between them you have these interconnects and you can configure, so you can configure the content of each box, like what is the Boolean function inside each box, and there's a register inside each box, and you can configure the, the connections between the boxes, and you can configure, you can, you can route some of those connections to these connectors to the outside world, okay? So, yeah, you can go on. Uh, and, so how do you program this? Like, what does it look like? Actually, first of all, you don't program this. It's not a computer, right? It, 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 it's a circuit. So what you're doing is you're designing a circuit that is made up of the lookup tables and the register. So the model of designing these circuits is this, uh, that is most widely used is the so-called register transfer level model. So what that means is that we pretend that we have registered the particle each size. Now, of course, in, in a real FPGA, this could, this could be multiple uh, registers, like you know, uh, horizontally, I guess, you can cut them up. So you have these registers, and then you have a combination of circuits. They have some functions. So this is just Boolean gates wired together. And then the function is fed the current value of the register and something from the outside world. And then the result of that combination of circuit is fed back into the register. And of course, because we want this to do something useful, we also have some fact that look at the result of this. Now, of course, we can put this step either here or here, which means either we, we, we can get you know, the value just as it's computed or, or just as it comes out of this circuit, or we can get it in the next cycle as it was already stored in the register. So this is the model. So what, uh, yeah. yeah, so this is the model. And so we are we can build interesting and fun stuff just by put, you know, choosing the right function and wiring them together in a fun way. So yeah, we can go on. So yeah, this is all the Haskell stuff that doesn't matter for us. Uh, yeah. Okay, so 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 what is the fun thing to build? Right? What is something that's tangible and, and, and gives you immediate feedback and gives you immediate satisfaction? Well, games, right? So uh, an FPGA that plays a linear game means that you have a circuit that implements a particular game. So you're not we're not building a computer. We could build a computer on an FPGA and then write software for that. That's not what we're doing here. So instead, uh, what we do is we take we, we build the smallest simplest possible video game console. So this has a single button input and some video output, and it has a register containing the state of the game. And then we have some circuit which is the logic of the game. So this is some combination of circuits, some Boolean circuit. And then we have the video system. And then one of the output, so the video system has two outputs, the video signal, which will connect to the screen. And the other output is whether this is at the end of the frame. So, so you know, because the TV is frame by frame, you know, discrete frame. And in fact, uh, we will make it a bit more constrained and we say that, okay, the only effect that the frame picker has is that it enables the register to update. So basically, the game logic runs, like, like we have to, I'm sorry, it doesn't run, yeah, it's not so hard. So game logic is like this fixed circuit. Its only input is whether the button is pressed and the current game state. But we only update the game state when the video hardware tells us that it's the end of the frame. So this way we have a regular you know, time, like regular clock for how the game itself runs, which is of course several levels of abstraction removed from the clock that drives the whole circuit. Okay, um, okay. So, so what does it mean to generate video? So we want this thing to output a signal that we can plug into a monitor. And then we get a game. So uh, CRT, which is the old kind of screen, right? Okay, everyone knows what the cube is, right? 
before S is D is about S. The way that works is that you have an electron beam that's like scanning the screen and it goes like a typewriter, so in the first line and then it goes like the second line and the third line and so on. And it does this. And basically when it gets here, it expects to get a signal that tells it to go back to the start of the next line. And when it gets here, it expects a signal to tell it to go back to the first line. Uh, and it does it on its own. So, so you just give it, you know, trigger here, 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 and then eventually here. And the, the, the screen will make like the circuit inside your TV will make sure that it does this scanning. Uh, and in particular, if you use VGA, which is an old analog video sender, that is the sweet spot that is old enough that it's super easy to understand because it's based on how these old TVs used to work. But also, it's very widespread. So these days, you can easily get screens still that have VGA input, and you, know, you can all order like a five dollar uh, gadget from AliExpress that would convert HDMI to VGA and so on. Um, the other direction is much harder. Uh, so, but, 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 yeah, we can go on. So then, all we need to do is we need to generate the right horizontal and vertical files, and there's a and there's a specification for, for particular videos. So for example, for our game, we want to produce 640 by 480 resolution at 60 frames per second. And then we can just look up you know, the big book of VGA timings that it takes this many microseconds to wait. And actually, if you add those two together, that's how long you have to wait until you, you have this pause. The pause has to be this many microseconds long, and so on. And, but this looks quite complicated to implement. Like, like, you know, all these weird, like, like 1.907 microsecond, how are we going to wait exactly that? So first of all, what you can see is that, of course, because it's it's a rectangle and, and the vertical thing will happen at the end of the line. So the vertical timings are naturally quantized to the time that it takes to draw a full line, full horizontal row. and and yeah, so, so the the the, the, the VGA signal also prescribes a so-called pixel clock, and basically everything is quantized to that. And now instead of all those weird numbers, we actually get 640, 16, 96, and 48 pixels. So if we have a timer, a, a clock that runs at 25.75 megahertz, then all we need to do to generate a valid video signal is to count to 656. Then count to 96 while the pool is signal low, then count to 48. You do this uh, 491 times, then you do it you know, two more times, then you do it 41 more times, and you have a valid video signal. Uh, yeah, this is how you didn't have in place, but that doesn't matter. But, but, uh, okay, so then, uh, uh, one more. yeah. So, so, so this gives us a blank screen, right? And now we have a valid signal. You can connect it to a screen and it will show you a black screen, but it will be a well-formed black screen. Like it will, it, it will sync to it and everything. But of course that's not enough. What we want to do is want to draw on the screen. So how do we draw on the screen? So as the electron beam is scanning the screen, we want to change its color. Now the color part is a bit, so I said that CRTs are good because they're easy to explain. Let's forget about color. Let's just pretend that they have a grayscale TV, like the old black and white TVs, because color is just a bit more complicated. So if you have a black and white TV, then you just need to change the intensity of the, of the electron B as it scans the screen. So our output from our circuit is this horizontal and vertical six signals and also the intensity of the beam at any given moment. So how do we draw with this? If only we know where the electron beam is scanning at any given moment, then we can just set the intensity to what we want to show at that given point. So if you want to have a fully black screen with a single white dot in the middle, then we just you know, count, we keep time, we count, okay, okay, so we're here, 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 and eventually we will get to the middle line. You know, keep counting, you keep counting, all of this happens independent of us in the screen, but we keep time. And now we know, okay, so we're now in the middle line. We keep counting, we keep counting. Now we're in the middle of the middle line. Okay, now set the intensity to high instead of the lowest, which means yeah, it's going to be the whitest, and everything else is black as black. Uh, so we 
take these counters that we already use to generate the right CV signals and we expose those counters to the rest of the circuit. Uh, yeah, we can go on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then we can write some fun games with it. So uh, I was basically asked to talk about Flash, which is uh, like Haskell for FPGA that has to be changed, but I had like a 15 minute slot. So I thought, okay, so what is a game that is simple enough that we can actually build it from scratch in Flash, in Haskell, uh, in, in that much time? And I realized that Fluffy Bird is actually a very, very simple game, except for <laughs> Fluffy Bird, we have to be fair because like growing a bird is very intricate. So, so what is it going to look like? So, hang on. So, okay, so what we want to do, right, is we have three missing, uh, two missing cases, right? We have the, the game logic. So we have this combination of circuit that is fed the old state and the button state and the button press and then the release state. And the other is the one that takes the current x y coordinate of the electron beam on the TV or the screen and then gives the, the color or the intensity of that. So now I'm of course switching back to color, but color is just three, you can think of color as just three black and white TV next to each other and each one has like a foil, a colored foil on it, right? They're just smashed together so that you can see that together. Uh, that, that's really difficult. Like that's, that's the complicated part, how do you smash the two together? Um, so yeah, so we're gonna make a very preppy version of Flappy Bird. So like, I was actually like preppy bird because um, we, 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 so this is the bird, and then the, the whole game is fully uh, predetermined in the sense that the, the, the pattern of the pipes is not random and it's just kind of keeps following the same pattern. But that's because, you know, 15 minutes is not a lot to build anything more complicated. And then when the game over, it just flashes the red background. Like that. Okay, so. Um, but, but, uh, okay, and. Yeah, this, so, 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 so the, the game logic itself is quite simple. How do we draw this? So remember we have from the video system, we have the X and Y coordinate of the current uh, pixel, the one that's being drawn just now. So basically if, if I want to put the bird somewhere, all I need to do is make a circuit that compares the X and Y coordinate of the currently drawn pixel to the x and y coordinate of the bird. And we know where the bird is because the game state tells us the height of the bird. Like if you think of a peppy bird, right? The state is where are you vertically? Horizontally, the bird doesn't move, right? Vertically, you know, you keep falling unless you press the button because then it keeps going up. So, so, so if you just compare, like, yeah, if, if x, y coordinate is here, then you say blue. If x, y coordinate is here, you say yellow. And same way for the pipes. If, if, if the y coordinate is below the, the, the height of the pipe, which you already, so, so the pipes, of course, are also needed for the game logic because that's how you know whether you died or not. Uh, so, so that's fed in here, and then you compare the y coordinate and you know, green or blue. And then if, if it's the end of the game, yeah, then if you, instead of blue, you do red. So, okay, so, but this looks even crappier than what I think the crappy bird should look like. It turns out that you can make a very simple improvement, which actually doesn't really, you can't really see it on the projected version, but you can see it in the real, if you look it up, because what I do here is that the X coordinate after, you know, like uh, division by 16 or whatever, huh? Yeah, no, but it's a color, it's not the resolution that you see. So, but basically what happens is then, yeah, we were white and then we have like a lighter, or sorry, black and then lighter green and then darker green based on the remainder of dividing the x coordinate by 16. And that gives us, which I'm, yeah, you can't see it here, but I promise you, you, you just get it on the screen. Then, uh, yeah, it gives you this nice uh, Super Mario-like shaded 3D effect of, of, of the pipe. Um, and of course, to, to get the unit for 16, it's super easy because you just look at the last four bits of the x coordinates. So, so you don't really need any complicated division circuit. Um, and that's it. So, uh, like I said, I don't have a live demo. Uh, can we open the YouTube video? Yeah, on well, the test, there's YouTube. Yeah. So, so here, this is, yeah. So this is the, this is an MTV dashboard that's completely working for this project, by the way. 
and then uh, and then yeah we upload it and then you can't see anything because the resolution is given by a zoom so but 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 at least you can see something is moving on the screen <laughs> you can see the you can see the video okay so so yeah so it's a, it's a so, so the end result of this just to, to summarize is that you have this small circuit it, it, it's really simple because all it is is that like two counters you know one of them is the horizontal counter and then it feeds into the vertical counter. So you have this two dimensional counter. Then you have a bunch of comparisons. You compare the output of that counter with some XY coordinates of the bird and the, the, the pipes. And that's it. And then it gives you a game that you can play. And then you hold the button for the bird to go up, you leave the button for the bird to start pulling down. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> Any questions that can be answered in a smaller time frame than the you mentioned about what SPJ you use? Sorry? What SPJ you use we haven't mentioned? Oh, so uh, actually, <laughs> so it, it runs on a bunch of SPJ boards. Uh, it, it, it should run on anything as long as. So, okay, so the way Clash works is, I mean, it's uh, very long, which is one of the industry standard uh, RTLs. So, or HDLs. So, so you can synthesize it pretty much anything as long as you have the I.O. And the only I.O. you need is video output and a single button. So the in, in this video, I, I, I'm using the, the Nexus A750 complete overkill. Uh, the Papilio one is a good one because it's like so ancient and so so uh, small. But uh, I I have a a uh, like that open, the one that has the open source is it saying you know what I I I I sport either yeah yeah yeah, yeah, that, yeah. so so lattice like has like some this. yeah so so I I I have now with them work for that as well but I haven't unpacked it yet so uh that I think that would be a re, very nice board for this because it has an open source blue chain yeah why did you do it on on FPGA? Like why did I? Well, the whole point of this was to originally was to give a demonstration of Clash, which is as good as PGA. Like I wanted to build something that is simple enough that it can be fully realized in a 50 minute talk. I mean, it's neat. Okay, so like if you're asking, like if you want to play Nothing Bird, and you know you, you don't have an iPhone that's going to have Bird on it. There are simpler ways to get to the point where you can play it than building it on an FPGA. I give you that, right? But this is the other way around. This is more like, oh, what is a fun thing you can, I, I, I can build on an FPGA that is simple enough that it can be done in a day and, and explained in an hour and, and does something that's recognizable. Yeah, because it's not just some random circuit. You really get, oh, this is puppy bird. Like, even if I didn't tell you that, right? If you just saw the yellow thing going between the green thing, you would have said, oh, that's puppy bird. But you don't have to explain them, right? Huh? No, no, so I didn't implement even that. It really is, it, it really is a crappy bird. It's not puppy bird. So the, this is completely like hardwired. So if I can see it here, actually. I think you can see it better than in the video here. The, the video of the game looks like. It could be randomized, it wouldn't take much to randomize, but it would have taken like let's say 10 minutes of valuable thought time. Right? So yeah, and there are lots of things you can that, that could be improved about this. And of course, there's no good reason that the play field should be the exact width of the screen. So there's no good reason that anything that goes out here immediately comes like you could have something longer. This is all everything is simplified to, to, to just make. Circuit description as I said. Yep. Yeah, I have one question. Um, so I have uh, up until uh, for my entire life up to this point, I've had maybe uh, one hour max of experience with Haskell. Um, so why would you prefer to write this entire project in Haskell and then uh, and then custom pilot right. very level and then it's inside? The so I assume you were in. Here at the previous time. Okay, so if you can actually go back to the slides just for the fun of it, and that's the last thing that's very nice slide, maybe. This one, yeah, it is. 
Yeah, so basically, I, I, I wrote all the ones for your question. <laughs> uh, so basically, all the, so, so very long and VAPL are the two mainstream hardware description languages. Those are the ones that are used by all the vendor tools and so on. And, and Flash compiles to very long so that it can be fed to these tools. And very long and VAPL are horrible. They, they are not good languages if you come to it from, a, from the point of view of like a, some, someone who works with languages. And not an electrical engineer. I'm sure electrical engineers love it because they don't necessarily know better. But these are, they are not, no, but seriously, like, like, like the same way that I don't, like, you know, the same way that I, I, I have no idea like what the power consumption of this lucky bird circuit is, right? Because I don't care. Same way electrical engineers would probably not know that, that, that there are aspects of language design that could actually help you and make you more productive and give you more tools of abstraction. So, for example, and uh, the the I really like how using Haskell I, I, I can write these reusable components. So this of course is, is self-contained because the whole point of it was to make it self-contained. But if I were doing it for real is yeah, I, I, I would for example uh, use a reusable video signal generator where the type of it ensures that if I use as I use it in Haskell, that I can't use it from the wrong uh, block. And also the type of it, you know, tells me that it's going to produce six courses by eighty. So that's what the visible export minutes are going to be. And I can't accidentally try to do anything with a export net of six fifty, right? So, so, so you have all these typing uh, uh, constraints that that you can impose on your stuff. And the the and, okay. And for example, in, in the in the Intel eighty eighty CPU that's written in Haskell, the the microcode. Is statically at compile and by time checking the, the, the microcode, we can ensure that there's no situation where you want to read and write at the same cycle from some memory address because the original machine that we are re implementing, which is this computer to home computer, had single port RAM. So, in any cycle, you can either write to it or read from it. And that's something that we can ensure that the microcode has this invariant at synthesis time. It just has. That sounds very magical. It sounds very magical. So okay, so if, but I can tell you, it, <laughs> when the work meeting. So look at my slides after this when you have time, and look at the the actual code that we have to write, the actual has code that we have to write to get the two words going, and and you will see that it, it, it's very you know, high level, simple. It it it. It does exactly what we want it to do without having to worry about a lot of the, other, the things that we don't want to worry about. So, like for example, the, 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 we just so, so to make the two counters, right? We just write the polymorphic function that can count to, to anything, and then we just instantiate that twice because that's your two counters. And then by by saying that the VGA signal generator gives you a 640 by 48 individual um, coordinates, yeah. That type itself can drive the. So we never write the comparator that will, for example, compare the counter to 640 to see if it's in the first half that is visible or the second half where it will be like the sync figures. That can, that's driven by the times. So there are lots of like neat things if you actually look through the, the slides, but I don't have time. And then, yeah, this is not the only thing we get to, to sell on, on, on Flash and, and Haskell. So that's why I thought, you know, I'm going to just talk about. That we were testing to the fine if it was done in, in any age. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks for.